thank you very much. Uh, so thank you very much for joining and for organizing this conference, you guys. And today we'll be talking about GPU programming and especially Metal and how you, and by you I mean all of you, can use it in your apps. Well, hopefully, because I still know that some of you think that Metal is scary. Well, I hope that after this talk you won't. My name's Alina, I'm an iOS engineer, kind of a tech enthusiast and just a passionate programmer. I love playing with different algorithms and sometimes you can see the results of it in my Twitter or Medium page and I'll share the link to those uh, later today. So the plan for the talk is the following. We'll discuss the concept of GPU programming in general and where, why and how you can use it. Then we'll take a look at metal as well as metal shading language and also um, the, the metal performance shaders framework and some other frameworks that basically these are the tools that Apple provide us with. And then we'll see what we can do with those tools and how to use them in our apps. So let's start with defining and discussing GPU programming. So to do that we need well, to clearly understand what a GPU is and why do we need it at all. Uh, simply, the GPU is a piece of hardware that's optimized to render graphics, and the main advantage uh, of, the, of the GPU for such processes lies in its construction, so the, the hardware thing. Uh, the GPU is composed with the, a lot of logic units, uh, and these logic units give it an ability to run lots of different tasks in parallel. Those logic units are called arithmetic logic units, or LAU, and they are basically the digital circuits that can perform arithmetic operations on binary numbers. numbers. That, that's it. So LAU is a fundamental building block of many types of computing circuits, including the, the CPU as well, the central processing unit, but as the CPU is more multi-purpose, it has less of those arithmetic units and more of some other stuff. Uh, on the contrary, GPU is really specific, so it has tons of those logic units, and these units can perform mathematical operations, and that's why the GPU can perform mathematical operations. Simple as it is. Uh, basically, that's the only reason uh, why it's suitable for graphics and all of the other operations that require simultaneous calculations or mathematical operations, something like that. Let's move on a bit. I'm sure you all know what motor threading is. Uh, where we have the, that great environment in which we create lots of threads and all the work that we distribute between those threads, the, it wor works like runs simultaneously and then we gather the results, we render them somehow, we show them on the screen and our user is happy. Right? Well, almost. Uh, it's important to understand that our hardware has limitations, less now than ever, but still. Uh, if your device has a six core CPU, for example, it will be able to run no more than six different tasks at each time frame, at each moment of time, uh, no matter how, threads, how many threads you create. So this means even though you can distribute your work, it still you can do more than your CPU is able to. But for the GPU, the situation is kind of different. Uh, each of those arithmetic logic units can be considered as a separate core, kind of. And for a better understanding, that's why I brought the multi-threading thing up, uh, you can consider the, the CPU running in your process concurrently, while the GPU gets you the real parallelism. So the speed of each calculation itself, if we include the time for sending those calculations to the GPU and, and preparing them and all these things, it may not be faster than on, this, on the CPU. But as lots of those calculations can be performed simultaneously, because of, well, lots of cores, uh, the whole process speeds up really impressively, especially with the big amount of operations. And this whole idea helps us to understand the best task that we can give to the GPU. Uh, these tasks, <coughs> sorry, these tasks include graphics rendering, image processing, computer vision, neural networks, deep learning, and many more. Basically, it can be any task that requires lots of algebra, vector calculus, or something like that. Anything you can come up with. Uh, to understand this even better, we're, we're going to compare the, the GPU and the CPU performance with a simple test to, to get to the real numbers. So you really understand how, how GPU is faster than the CPU. So the main idea of this test is we generate two random number arrays. These arrays are of fixed size. Um, so here it's five, but it, it will be more as well. And then we add each corresponding element of these uh, arrays and store the result in the third array. Sounds simple. 
So how we do it on, this, on, on the CPU, we do it using a for loop, and we start from the first elements with the index zero, we add them together, and after we've added those elements, we store the result in the third array. So that's one, one uh, step of our loop. This then we do for all iterations, we, we move, we add, we store in the third array. That's pretty much it. For the small arrays, it looks more or less good. Uh, we can achieve the needed results in a reasonable time, but for the bigger arrays, it will slow down, and we all know that it will. So we'll probably need to come up with a better approach, and the better being the GPU one. So instead of processing each element at a time, as in for loop, we're gonna do this simultaneously in separate threads. So we, we, we can do all of these addition operations at the same time. And then we'll store them in the third array as, as needed, so nothing more. Let's see the numbers. Uh, here you can see the results of those tests run on, on the GPU and the CPU. I wrote the, the Metal code and, well, Metal and Swift code, and then ran this program, and I got these results. So, you can see that still 30,000 of elements, the CPU is still much faster than the GPU. And for the three, three element array, it's the first image, the performance difference 7,000 times in favor of the CPU. On 300,000 of elements, the, the CPU starts to struggle a bit, but the time is still kind of good. I'd say that it's, that is good. But what happens if we increase the size of our arrays? This is what happens, uh, here's where it gets interesting. Of course, the, the GPU also needs some time to perform these calculations and to set up all the calculations and data, so it takes longer with each iteration, but for the race big enough, it can get much faster, much faster than the CPU. It looks pretty impressive, I'd say. So now you can see why, why the GPU is so good, for example, for image processing, because we can process all of our pixels change them, change their colors, so whatever, almost at the same time, or at the same time, depending on the image resolution. Uh, there's also one more thing to cover, it's like a side note, uh, as the, the GPU was basically designed to render graphics, um, it's considered its kind of natural purpose, graphics rendering, uh, so this is what we call GPU programming. But all of the other applications of the GPU, like image processing, computer vision, et cetera, they were discovered much later. I'd say about 10 to 15 years ago, they, they became more or less popular. And now they get their own name. It's the GP, GPU programming, which means general purpose GPU programming. Uh, you'll hear me using the GPU programming for uh, the, the GPU programming term for all of the things. It's just because it's shorter to pronounce. As you see, there, there's lots, lots of different things that we can use the GPU for, so you can really get creative, but to, to really get creative, you need to have the proper instruments. And fortunately, we have them, uh, the most important of them being metal, well, for Swift developers, I mean, for some other people, there are other instruments. So Metal is the GPU programming framework that was introduced by Apple in 2014, and it allows us, the developers, to use the device's GPU for rendering graphics or running some computations in parallel. But more importantly, it's something that brought the words Apple and gaming together in one sentence, probably for the first time. And as gaming requires lots of graphics rendering, Introducing Metal was the first step away from old GPU frameworks and, and standards. Uh, they had a lot of long-standing issues. They were not optimized for Apple's hardware, and that's, that's a pretty impressive step. So let's see what they did there, how, how they changed it. So the, the CPU and the GPU, they always work in offset. The CPU prepares commands, and then it sends them to the GPU. While the GPU is processing the commands um, that it has received, the, the CPU is preparing the next batch. Uh, but this batching and sending the commands, it, it, it's pretty, mm, I'd say, expensive in terms of time. And often the CPU is unable to send enough work uh, for, to keep the GPU busy, so the GPU sits idle and does nothing, which is kind of not good. Uh, what Metal does, Metal increases the efficiency of this offset 
So the GPU can be used at its full capacity. And part of this increased efficiency is accomplished by eliminating the need to copy memory between CPU and the GPU as it was necessary before. So the CPU and the GPU in Apple devices, it occupies the same chip, which means that the CPU basically grants access to the GPU to modify the data directly, and there is no need to, to copy the resources or the, the data back and forth, which kind of helps us with, with this all efficiency thing. Um, let's see then how we can program the GPU, how we can send our commands. So how does it work for us developers? In Metal, you send commands to, to the GPU so it can perform work on your behalf. This relationship uh, with, with be between Metal apps and the GPU is kind of a client-server model where your app being a client and the GPU being a server, you send requests, you make requests by sending commands to the GPU. Uh, you encapsulate these commands into command buffers, then you put them into command queue, and then after processing the commands, the GPU notifies your app when it's ready for more work, so kind of back and forth communication. The GPU is presented at Metal by an object that, is conform, uh, that, that conforms to the Metal device protocol. The Metal device is responsible for creating and managing a variety of persistent objects to process data and render it to the screen. So that's all done by Metal device. Basically, as it represents the GPU, that sounds logic. Uh, then the, there are commands. The, the commands that you want your GPU to perform, they're encoded uh, and enqueued in the command buffer first. Uh, once all the commands are enqueued, the command buffer is committed and submitted to the command queue. So that's kind of the whole structure. Each command is executed in the order that it was enqueued. So pretty straightforward, I hope. Um, all the commands need to be encoded before, and you can choose what type of command encoder you need, depending on, on what work you would want your GPU to perform. There are four different uh, ways to encode commands for the command buffer, because there are, well, four different encoders here. Uh, you use the render command encoder for graphics rendering, for example, for creating textures or for, for gaming and so on. Then you can use compute command encoder to do all the computations, like mathematical operations, for example, uh, uh, matrices, multiplication, something like that. Uh, you can use the bleed command encoder for memory management, and you can use the parallel, ren parallel render encoder to do while well rendering in parallel. Um, the GPU is responsible to process our data, and we're responsible to give it the instructions on how to do so. Well, the data and the instructions. Uh, to write these instructions, we need to use a specific programming language and create the functions that will basically do the processing. These functions are called metal functions or metal shaders. The metal shader can be of three different types. Uh, it can be the vertex shader, the fragment shader, or the compute shader that is also sometimes called kernel. Basically, metal shader is just a um, metal file, so the file was extension.metal, and inside there is a code that's written with the MSL, with metal shader language. That that what makes it a shader. So the, the, the function the GPU um, actually takes and executes on each data point or for each pixel to be rendered. So if you're trying to render an image or uh, process your image, uh, your shader or your function will be run on each pixel or each data point. That's important thing to remember. So to write our own shaders, we need to use the metal shading language. Metal shading language is pretty much similar to other shading languages, such as, for example, OpenGL shading language, uh, GLSL, which you have probably heard of if you have worked with shaders or just got interested in. So the MSL is based on C++14, so if you're familiar with the C++ syntax, it should be easy to understand. However, there's, there's something to remember. So the, the MSL is very specific and very small language. So lots of regular C++ features, they're not available in Metal completely, such as, for example, Lambda expressions, go-to statements, etc. cetera. Uh, there is also no support for such data types, such, uh, for example, a string and similar. 
And you also shouldn't use the C++ standard library because the metal has its own standard library. So that's just something to remember. Apart from that, Apple is really putting some work in building different frameworks on, on top of metal. So some of them are more high level, some of them are not, but they're all tailored for specific functionality. So such frameworks, they include SpriteKit, SyncKit for gaming, Core Image for image processing, CoreML even for machine learning, and, and many, many more. I'm sure you've worked with at least one of them, but I hope more. Uh, they also include Metal Performance Shaders Framework, which is kind of the best of all worlds. So the Metal Performance Shaders Framework contains a collection of highly optimized compute and graphics shaders. They're designed to integrate easily and efficiently into your apps because, well, they're done to, to be integrated into your apps. Uh, the reason that Apple created this framework is that there are really lots of common operations in graphics rendering, machine learning, and image processing, proce processing, and there's no real point for each developer to reinvent the wheel or like to copy paste the same code over and over again. More importantly, um, I think most importantly, they took some time and they optimized those shaders for all of their devices. So all of the included functions, they're specifically tuned to take advantage of the unique hardware that is inside of each GPU you can imagine in Apple devices. So, so the, the performance is really, really optimized. Uh, the framework includes different types of shaders and basically supports different functionality. So there's image processing, which means applying high performance filters to different images or extracting some information uh, information from the images, for example, statistical information or his building histograms and so on. Then there's neural, neural networks, uh, well, basically implementing and running neural networks, not more than that. Then there's math, uh, which is solving systems of equations, factoring matrices, multiplying matrices, and many more. And then there's ray tracing. <laughs> Well, the, this framework contains lots of useful stuff, so it's worth at least checking out before you try to implement something on your own because that it's like very probable that there is a shader already written for you that you don't need to implement on your own. Well, that all was kind of a simplified overview of the concepts and the instruments you need to be familiar with before trying the GPU programming well, with Metal. Um, this can sound a bit overwhelming, at least to me it did when I first started reading and finding out about all, all of those stuff, but I can say that there is a simpler way. Uh, well, for, for those of you who want to implement your own neural networks or extract data from images, th there isn't. You have to do all of this stuff. But for others, there is. And uh, this other way was introduced at this year's WWDC, and it brought us the amazing collaboration, I'd say. Uh, the collaboration is Metal and SwiftUI, of course. So you can't have any more excuses not to learn Metal or not to try Metal because, well, it's simple now. Let's see what we can do here. So with the recent updates, SwiftUI now provides extensive integration with Metal shaders right at the view level, so any view. We can manipulate colors, shapes, many more parameters, and everything with an optimized and smooth performance. So to do that, we got a brand new shader structure and a bunch of view modifiers, to, to, to be precise, three, three view modifiers. Um, as you all may notice, it is of course available only from iOS 17 and macOS 14 which is kind of a bummer because my MacBook here is from year 2017 and it does not support Mac OS 14, so I had to do some stuff to make it work. But yeah, maybe I'm a dinosaur, but some of you may be as well, just keep that in mind. Uh, so the process requires three simple steps. We're creating, we should create a metal file with the shader. Uh, we've already discussed it today. It must have an exact function signature which varies depending on what kind of effect you want to apply. Then you need to create a Swift UI view of any type, really any type, it can be a rectangle, it can be an image, whatever. And then you add this view modifier, pass there your shader, and you're all happy. 
So the important thing to remember is that uh, shaders are called on each data point or for each pixel to be rendered. So this means that the shader will have a reference to which pixel they are shading at a particular time. Then we perform some calculations and then we determine the desired new color or new position of the pixel. Uh, the shading function also takes some parameters such as time or, well, almost any parameter you can think of uh, if you need that to create, for example, nice animations. Um, as we've already covered, there, the, there are three new effects uh, that are introduced to work with SwiftUI. Each of these effects is responsible for a different task. So th there is a color effect, which basically uses the shader function to modify each pixel's color. Uh, then there is a distortion effect, which applies a, a geometric distortion on pixel location. So you, well, you change the pixel location, that's pretty much it. And then there's layer effect. Uh, layer effect returns a new view that applies a shader um, as a filter on the raster layer created from the original view. So which is good about the layer effect is that you can sample not only the pixel that you are processing right now, but also the other pixels in the layer. That is useful for, well, for different filters that we're gonna cover later today. Uh, we're gonna try this all now, right in our own metal functions, and we'll start with the color effect. Um, the, the metal function, well, the metal function to work as a color effect, it should have a function signature that looks like this. So the, the first thing that you see is this stitchable attribute. It's basically an attribute that enables parallel pixel processing. Then there's half four. The half four is the return type uh, and it represents the resulting pixel color. Uh, the format is RGBA. Standard. Um, then there's um, uh, the parameters that we take. Then there, there's flow to type position. So flow two is a vector of well two float numbers, and the position is the um, uh, starting position that uh, is in the user space coordinate of the pixel that we're processing right now. So the the arguments uh, can be different. For some effects, you can extend these arguments. For some effects, you can leave just the position and that's all. So for, for the first color effect here, we're gonna create a metal function here that takes a user space coordinate and it also takes the source color of each pixel and returns the modified color. So as you can see here, we, we start simple. We have a function that returns just a solid color to fill our view, so each pixel we're gonna for each pixel, we're gonna turn the same color. And uh, it doesn't matter which position or which initial color this pixel has. Uh, to apply this shader to our view, we need to wrap it up in a shader structure. And to do so, we need to get the shader function from the default library. The default library is basically the library where our all metal files are rendered to. So all of your functions, even if they're in different files, they will be rendered to the default library. And after we got the function, we, we need to check if we spelled the name of the fu function correctly, because it's a string parameter, there can be some issues. And after we did that, we need to create a shader, initialize it from the function, and pass there an empty array of arguments. This may look weird because as we all remember, our metal function requires the position and the initial color of the pixel. However, these two are passed automatically, so we don't need to fill these arguments into our arguments array. We need to add something there only when, you have, uh, when we have our own specific parameters. Uh, then we create a view, and we apply our color effect. So looks pretty simple and uh, it results in this green nice rectangle. But the color effect is much more than just filling shapes with solid colors. So you can apply, of course, apply these effects to images, you can create patterns, you can create animations, you can create noise, you can denoise your images after that and, and many more. So basically with the color effect, you can do everything that has color changes of an image. That's it, anything. 
Um, now let's take a look at the distortion effect. Um, little spoiler back here, uh, I'll post the source code for the things. There are like a couple of lines for each effect, so you can try that, it's really simple. Yeah, back to, to the distortion effect. Uh, as the color effect changes the color of the pixel, distortion effect modifies the pixel position. So for a shader function to act as a distortion effect, um, it does not need to have any specific arguments other than pixels coordinate, and then we return the pixels coordinate as well, which is basically a vector of um, two parameters. But the static distortions are fine, uh, but the animated ones are even more fun. So to achieve the animated effect, we need to pass the time parameter and then perform the calculations with the regard of the time. Uh, this is how our shader will look like. We're gonna create a shader that makes a wavy animation on, on an image. So we take the initial position of the pixel and then we add a change in value depending of the, of the time uh, with, the with, the, well, with the regards of the time. Uh, you can see here that we modify only the um, Y position, so the X1 is unchanged. You can also change the X1 if you want. So whatever you wish, you can try both. Uh, the initialization of the shader is pretty much the same. Uh, we, we get the name, we get the library, we get our shading function. And then the shader initializer looks a bit different because now we pass the custom argument of time. And the arguments array, it accepts the values of a specific type. This type is called argument, well, shader dot argument. This type can be created from float vectors, from single float values, from colors, and from some more useful types, such as, for example, bounding rect. You can pass it there as a parameter as well. This is how I apply a shader to the desired view, for example, the same star image. Um, you should specify one more parameter for the distortion shader, or for the distortion effect, sorry. So the, there's this parameter that's called max sample offset, and basically it represents the maximum distance in each axis between the return source pixel's position and the destination pixel's position for, for all pixels. And to make this effect animated, we add this timeline view animation on top, and then we pass the time, um, the, the current time uh, that is well updated each second, and this code will result in a nice wavy animation. But one more thing because before I show the animation, uh, you see that there is a foreground color set, but you can also chain, for example, the shader effect, so you can call the color effect before and uh, change uh, the, the color of your view with the metal shader and then call the distortion effect and it will result in the same nice star. But you also can notice, I don't know if you can, especially those who are in the back, but some of you maybe can, that um, our image gets cropped at some point on top or, or, or at the bottom and this happens because our shader cannot extend the view. So we can modify the pixel position, but inside of the view, we cannot make it bigger. So this means that if we're returning an invalid position, so if our shader returns the coordinate that is outside of the view, it just leaves the pixel transparent, so nothing changes there. It's just something to, to remember. And then there's last thing, uh, the layer effect. Uh, the shader function should have a signature matching the ones that you see right here. What's different? There is one more parameter, the Swift UI player. And also, on top of that, you can see that you have to include the Swift UI metal header, because if you don't, it won't work. Uh, this is don't need it for the previous effect, only for the layer effect. So this Shader, shader function, it takes the user space coordinate as all of our functions uh, and also the subregion of the pixel, so the, the raster contents of the view, which is the layer, as an input. Uh, we should return the color, uh, the color for the destination pixel. Typically, the layer effect is needed when we need to calculate the result in color with regard of the, for example, color values of surrounding pixels. Uh, this 
kind of makes effect more generic because you can implement all the image processing fun stuff, such as convolutional filters, for example. Uh, we can create, well, yeah, blurs, convolutional filters, and mm, sub -op operators, and well, lots of different functions. This thing, this scary thing here, <laughs> we, we look at the circle blur, or it's also called the bokeh effect. Uh, so to create this effect, basically you need to average the colors around the pixel that you're looking at, and assi assign this value to the pixel. So um, this is why we have this for loop here. I remember that some of you asked me if we can run the for loop on the GPU yesterday. Yes, we can. <laughs> Uh, so uh, we have this for loop, we take uh, 100 pixels around our uh, pixel at the position and then we divide our resulting number of the sum of the, uh, of the color pixels divided by 100 and return it. Uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, this is how it looks. Uh, this slider here, I added it to, to, well, to make it more blurred or less blurred, which you can do, or you can use the static radius and uh, don't add any sliders. This is the bokeh effect. So one thing to note, uh, the layer effect should also accept the max sample offset parameter at the distortion effect, but it means something a little bit different here. Uh, basically, if the shader function samples from, from the layer uh, at some locations that are not equal than the process pixel, so if we want to sample the color of the surrounding pixel, we must specify the maximum sampling distance. So if, if we wanna sample the hundreds pixel from the one that we're processing, our max, sampling, um, max sample offset should be 100 or more. Uh, what's next? Uh, so during the stock, we've covered the details of the GPU programming in, in general and what can we use the GPU for. And we've also discussed metal and probably you are thinking of what should you do about that right now. Well, for starters, you should, I hope you will, play with metal and SwiftUI effects. You can see that it's pretty simple to add different uh, colors, different uh, effects and everything to your SwiftUI views and it also can have a lot of different applications in your apps. For example, well, I see it right now, you can add a distortion effect, like wavy animation on the button that you've just clicked or something like that, so a lot of different applications. And then, after you're all comfortable with Metal and SwiftUI, I encourage you to take a look at the frameworks that we've discussed today, starting with the Metal performance shaders, or after that, you can dive right into Pure Metal, you can do games, textures, image processing, and much, much more. This, of course, if you want to do some complex stuff. Thank you very much for being here today. If you have any questions, please go on. Thank you very much for your talk. It was very, very interesting. Um, I'm wondering, you said you have an old MacBook. Um, is there any uh, implication when running all that stuff on Intel hardware? Uh, are there difference between Intel or M M2 or something? Well, um, thank you for your question. I'd say there's no difference in terms of both implementation and the speed and everything, but I had to come up with some stuff to make it work because uh, as my Mac here does not support the Mac OS 14, this means that I cannot update. This means that I can download the Xcode 15 better, but I cannot run the code that I've written on my MacBook. That is why I updated my iPhone here to iOS 17, connected it, and ran it on my iPhone. So that's kind of the workaround you have to come up with, but in terms of speed or code or uh, implementation, nothing changes between the, the MacBooks. Um, sorry, I got another question. Yes. <laughs> sorry. Um, I uh, played around with Metal a few years ago and uh, it was not possible to run it in a simulator. Is it possible now? Uh, 
well, it, it's not possible just to run the, the, the same metal code that you will, were probably playing around with the, at that time, but uh, you can see your effects in preview if, of course, your Mac is updatable to <laughs> Mac OS 14. Fortunately, it is the last time, I think, but fortunately, it is. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sure. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I have a question regarding this array example you uh, showed at the beginning. Um, because uh, Swift uses this uh, geometric growth strategy, for example, when you have four items in an array and then you append the next one, then it has eight. And for example, when you then exceed eight, then you have uh, 16. Uh, the capacity, how does it work for metal? Because you said you can all do all these operations at once. So how does metal decide to uh, resize the array? Thank you for your question. So I'd say metal has little to nothing to do with that. So for in this example, we just create the arrays as, as regularly on the CPU, so we don't um, we don't measure the time of creating the arrays, but after that, uh, we're either running a for loop on the CPU or translate, well, translating, encoding our arrays into buffers. And after it became a data buffer, only then the metal, well, the GPU can process it. So that's kind of like a different level of working on. Thank you for your talk. I have two questions for you. The first one, have you got any experience with OpenGL and what was it? How can you compare it? Well, I, ha I had some experience with OpenGL, uh, well, mostly for image processing, not for uh, shading or, or gaming or um, texture generation, but uh, well, I don't know if I can compare it <laughs> because, well, that's different, kind of it's the same thing, but for different applications, so that's like, one. Uh, can you tell me more? What was the project, like the goal you were trying to achieve? If that's not a secret, obviously. No, well, that's not a secret. I was working with the, the image processing <sighs> for machine learning models, well, pre-processing and then pre-processing before, um, giving them to the model, so that's pretty much it. But if you want some more details, we can probably chat about that mm. later today. Now that I'm thinking about it, have you tried Vulkan or Molten VK? No, not really, but I know they, they exist, <laughs> but I didn't work with them. Okay, and this was supposed to be the second question now. Um, why are you doing this? This is a very complicated topic. <laughs> Uh, why did you dive into this? What kind of app? Is it a game engine? Is it a photo editor? Is it uh, animation software? It's Tell fun. me a story. It's fun. There is no story behind it. I, I think it's fun. And well, actually, I came here today, so at least some of you think that it's fun too. <laughs> and I hope that it will happen. But uh, well, the backstory of how I found out about Metal is uh, the same thing with the image processing. So. Um, there is a model, uh, the, there are ML models that Apple pass on their website, you can download them. And there's also a model that is uh, trained to recognize the handwritten digits. This model is based on an Amnes data set, which is pretty much the big data set of handwritten digits. And uh, when I download this model from Apple website, I assume that it should work. That, that was my first assumption, but then I tried it and it didn't, well, it worked, but it didn't give me the results that I was expecting. Uh, the results being I passed there a number three and the result should be three, but it's somehow zero or seven. And I tried to find out what's the reason for that, because I assumed that there is no problem with the model, so prob probably there is problem with me or something like that. And then I realized that I have to pre-process the images before sending them to, before feeding them to the model. And I tried to do this with uh, core image filters because it's the first thing that 
comes up when you think of image processing in Swift, because I was trying to do an iOS app that recognizes handwritten digits. Uh, and after I tried to do this with core image, I kind of realized that there are some filters, but uh, even though they're enough for some situations, they're maybe not enough for some other image processing operations. And then I Googled what should they do, and the first result was metal, and that's, that's why I'm here. <laughs> Very interesting, thank you. Thank you, Alina. Please give her a big round of applause.